Thanks, everyone, and thanks for inviting me to speak, Susan. It's a huge honor and responsibility to be in the footsteps of such a legacy. I thought I would start just thinking about the talk we heard and framing the question, what is a work of art in the age of $120,000 $20,000 art degrees with a reflection on what it might mean for the Schumacher Center for a New Economics to think about creative enterprise today. And especially with Lang's question about the difference between coming of age now and coming of age in the 80s. And I was thinking that I too, you'll notice, will traffic in the image of the creative entrepreneur with the biography that's never ending, what Ulrich Beck calls this uh, endless biography that's constantly being rewritten and performed, that you see uh, in what Foucault calls the entrepreneur of the self. So I think we have to be very critical in this era of creative enterprise of the ways in which creative people become these entrepreneurs of the self to an end where extraction might seem inevitable and where value is produced for corporations. So I too traffic in a biography that is an entrepreneur of the self, but it's one that tries to use the vernacular jargon of today for a praxis so that a creative entrepreneur is someone who has a praxis of cooperation and mutual aid and where that lifestyle, if you want to call it that, cannot be redacted from what it means to be a creative person. So while I think it must have been incredibly frightening in the 80s and in the Cold War to think about life as a creative person and the fear of the state politically. What I imagine now is the censorship that I live within and my peers experience is one of a political economy that makes this kind of outspoken radicality almost impossible because we have a debt burden that necessitates a certain kind of work and imagination. So you'll notice that I too tell my story, but let's hope that you can see how it ends in a space of coalition building rather than one singular initiative. And that this can be a way to imagine a kind of creative entrepreneur that is necessarily responsible for a praxis of cooperation. So I like to remind people that I work in groups. You'll see me speaking here, but there are many people that I am responsible to and in love with. These are people that I collaborate with, often through volunteer networks or sometimes funded, sometimes not funded, nonprofits. So I'd like to take a moment to honor Jen Abrams, Louise Ma, Rich Watts, Carl Tashin, Orzubalski, Rachel Vera Steinberg, Cheyenne Weber, Annie McShiris, Michael Johnson, Blair Murphy, Susan Jehoda, Vicki Virgin, Julian Boylan, Ben Lerchin, Lika Volkova, Stephen Corns, Maureen Connor, Laurel Patak, Shane Selzer, Robert Sember, Mark Reed, Lizzie Hurst, Claire Beaumont, Christine Wang, Colin McMullen, Brendan McMullen, Hung No, Lee Claire LaBerge, Orzubalski, Roger Hughes, and Christian Diaz. So because I'm in groups, I like to make agendas. I'll start with a story and then think through where we are, what is this beautiful place, the Judson Church, and think through what I'm doing here speaking to you, and try and tie together the sharing economy, Web 2.0, social practice art, and a vision for land trusts, hopefully before 2030, but definitely by then. So I'll start with a story. In 2011, I wanted to get into the Museum of Modern Art without paying. The tuition, sorry, uh, slip, the price tag of admission has risen to $25, and this is an important public institution, so I thought there must be a way to enter without paying. 
I had been bartering as an artist to meet many of my needs. I went up to the cashier and I said I might repair something or offer childcare, listen or sing, make jam from forage berries, tell forgotten histories, take risks, facilitate a meeting, speak truth, communicate without words, or appreciate art. And she said, it's $25. <laughs> And I tried to remind her of the inspiring work of the Community Economies Collective and the way they describe the dominance of wage labor in a capitalist firm, whereas there are so many ways that we meet our needs together, on the street, between friends, in church or temple, within families, under the table, through informal lending, raising children, in many ways. And she said, listen, lady, I'm not in charge. This is just my job. You should come back on Friday. It's free then. And so I left, and I went to a park nearby that some of you might know. And I looked at these trees and wondered how old they are and what they've seen. I kept thinking about these honey locusts and what beauty they have, and that they were available. And there still are some public spaces in this city public culture, you might call it. And I realized that to barter, both parties need agency. You can't be someone working for someone else and engage in a negotiation of the value of your own work because that's not up to you. It's just a job. But I don't want to live in a world where I just work a job and I don't have agency to talk about whether someone can enter a space or not. So this is a talk about my search for places where voluntary reciprocal exchange is both possible and necessary. And it's not just about barter, it's about land trusts and solidarity economies as well. So where are we? What is this cold church? For me, this is a place where my heroes and heroines, my grandmothers and inspirations were born. If you haven't been here before, this is an incredible place to come back to. And as someone who went to Cooper Union, which has been tuition free for 154 years, this was our legacy. So we learned about Yvonne Rayner, who made The Mind is a Muscle, this minimalist dance piece here. We learned about Yoko Ono and the Fluxus movement and the ways in which she had us imagine to put our shadows together until they became one. And this is also a time where John Hendricks, who's now the Fluxus Curator at MoMA, was able to serve as a conscientious objector because this was a place where you could do your service. And there was an art ministry, something that I'd like to see in many convents and churches throughout the city. It was also a place where Klaus Oldenburg experimented with complementary currency, albeit only for the night of a performance with ray gun specs. It was a place where artists like Deborah Hay met with all these other artists and tried to blur art and life, making performances on rooftops and turning the seating that you typically see inside dance and theater spaces to the window so that you could look out and see dancers on all of these rooftops. It was a place where Bread and Puppet performed and where the cheap art manifesto made sense. As they say, people have been thinking too long that art is a privilege of the museums and the rich. Art is not business. It does not belong to banks and fancy investors. Art is food. You can't eat it, but it feeds you. Art has to be cheap and available to everybody. It needs to be everywhere because it is, it is the inside of the world. Art soothes pain. Art wakes up sleepers. Art fights against war and stupidity. Art sings hallelujah. Art is for kitchens. Art is like good bread. Art is like green trees. Art is like white clouds in the blue sky. Art is cheap. Hurrah. And I wanted to remind all of us, as we're called here, that today marks the third anniversary of the eviction from Zuccotti Park. 
So this is what it felt like three years prior as so many people were unexpectedly removed from a space that was so important and still is. And these two are honey locusts. I keep wondering if trees remember. And so what am I doing here speaking to you as I don't have a deep connection to land reform for agriculture? I'm not an economist, but I do think small is beautiful. I hope that as we see a movement that has sometimes been called social practice art, the new economy, Web 2.0, and creative placemaking swirl around each other in this contemporary landscape of discourse that we're all moving toward land trusts and that by moving agriculture and the rural mouse to the city mouse, there's a place for artists to join movements with this legacy. So we'll see. Maybe you also invited me because I'm young. So I thought I'd take you through some things that happened in my own biography, and excuse me if this is the entrepreneur of the self that you all fear. So I was only 15 during Y2K. I was in high school during the dot-com burst. I entered college, Cooper Union, the year after 9-11, not knowing fully what Manhattan really was. And I graduated the year before the foreclosure crisis, entering a world where I remember working for an artist, Katrin Siegerdotter, and hearing her parents on the phone as they described their entire bank accounts evaporating in Iceland. And this was what I graduated into. My friends were saying, it's hard to take risks when you have loads of debt. I can't risk starting a family. I wish I could afford a home and a job I really want. I'm a different person than I want to be because of my debt. And so I honestly considered robbing a bank. In fact, it runs in the family. My grandfather, my dad finally told me, actually was a bank robber. That's what he did in his Great Depression he was working on a tobacco farm. That's what Willards do. And he couldn't survive. And he felt that the only way he could feed himself and maybe even his family was to steal a car, drive to Florida, and try to rob a bank. And it's unclear in our family lore whether he succeeded or not, but likely it didn't work out that well because he changed his name and joined the military. <laughs> so my dad was born with a fake last name and didn't come back to his own family, the Woolards, on the tobacco farm until he was in his teens when his father, my grandfather, decided that he was tired of hiding and that he needed to see his family. Lucky for my father, when he was drafted, he was able to object as a conscientious objector and then ride the GI Bill as the first Woolard to ever go to college. He was able to offer me a private high school where I learned the class etiquette that made me gain cultural capital to be here today. But I didn't graduate in a time where people had GI bills or uh, the kind of energy around me, at least, to try and rob a bank and change our last names. Not as easy in the Facebook era. So I decided I'd do something much, much smaller. And I would try and use every dollar I made for artwork that I'd put in public so I would avoid paying rent. So as I graduated school, I decided that I would sleep on rooftops, and I would sleep in cars, and I would sleep anywhere except a house with a landlord, because to me that meant getting on a treadmill whereby every dollar I made went into my rent. Because most people I know live for their landlord. And I knew that I didn't want to be transformed by a workplace that told me that I was expendable, 
that the only way we could make decisions was by being told what to do, by not making decisions. And so I tried this for a while. I finally found a shed and I sheetrocked it, but it didn't work for many reasons. And the window that you see in this image, a friend of mine, someone who I didn't know that well, but who was becoming a friend, she let me use her shower. She said, why don't we start a space together? And I said, that's hilarious because I have no money, so I don't know how we'll ever do something like that. And she's right here on the right, uh, Christine Wang. She said, I can get my parents to write us a check if we say we'll pay them back in two years. And we wouldn't have been eligible for a commercial loan, and it turns out that I'm still not. But we were able to get $30,000 together and agree to pay $8,000 a month for five years. So we spent an entire summer building out a space with many friends. And what we thought we'd get is cheap rent, but what we got in the end was a family. And as someone who had been in school while my parents were divorcing, it wasn't something that I talked about, but I needed the social and intellectual and emotional community that also comes with mutual aid. So I thought I was doing it for cheap rent and a way to support my practice as an artist, but I also found other sides of cooperation incredibly inspiring. And as Christine Wang and I talked about what it meant to work together, we had to think through a lot of histories of oppression that came up in our relationship, the ways in which many people were taken out of neighborhoods in New York City through practices of redlining, through the ways that the homeowner's loan corporation made it impossible to refinance or get mortgages if you were not white, the way the creation of a white identity happened in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s through loan practices and bank practices that made groups that saw each other previously as Italian, Irish, Eastern European, now suddenly under this umbrella of whiteness. And Christine Wang and I would have many conversations about the way race played out interpersonally and how we wanted to change the way we ran our space. So I know that solidarity economies are possible. We experience them in that space. And I wanted more places like that, more experiences like our studio. And I knew that there are many creatives more artists identify their primary occupation, sorry, more Americans identify their primary occupation as artist than as lawyer, doctor, or police officer. And as we know, funding for the arts has been declining. Since 2009, 80% of arts organizations in New York are reducing their budgets, and more than 50% are reducing staff and canceling programs. So we thought, maybe we can find a way for artists to get support. Another way of putting it is that in a financial crisis, we have a networked information age and more and more creative people, so perhaps we can put them in touch with each other. It's a site where people list what they have and what they need. Right now, some skills, spaces, and objects on the site are urban farms, urban gardening, intuitive readings, writing and editing, vegan baking, herbal medicine. So it moves beyond art, design, or activism into all kinds of creative practices. You help people, hopefully, because of their projects, because you're interested in what they do. And we've found more and more that people end up gifting or collaborating as often as they barter. It starts with a conversation and you take it from there. We realized at some point that you don't need to trade one-on-one, -on -one, that many people want to teach a group. And so we started something called Trade School where you bring services or objects to your teacher. You agree to bring them. And then we made an open source platform that spread to 50 cities where people agree to the principles of Trade School and then share skills with their community. 
We started thinking, though, that in this networked information era with many people like this staring out in classrooms that looked like a hierarchy, we wondered, do you actually know each other? Are you already texting and tweeting to one another right now? It seemed like we should ask the question, in an information revolution, why do you go to class in person at all? And then we remember that it's to meet, to touch, to have that tactile poetry. This is a composting workshop. To connect to people across class and get opportunities that you might not have otherwise. To have debate in real life. And to also recall that the political economy of your education is just as full of teaching as the content itself. So when you learn in a space that's collectively organized and run on barter, you also learn about other ways of meeting needs together. But at some point I thought, enough with new initiatives. I felt that many people thought the barter group was in competition with the time bank, which was in competition with the community currency, and that all these small initiatives weren't actually sharing membership, but instead were antagonistic and uh, almost branded with charismatic leaders. So I found out about something called the Solidarity Economy Movement, and I found it so beautiful and such an image of the world that I want to be in, one where community currencies and barter clubs are seen as two of many options for exchange and transfer, and where consumption and use happens in collective houses, cooperatives, and where surplus allocation happens with community reinvestment struggles, cooperative banks, community financing, where creation happens through the commons and community land trusts, and where production is DIY or in a producer cooperative, worker cooperative, there are many options. Ethan Miller wrote this as he connected me to a group called Solidarity NYC. I didn't mention it, but I was working the night shift during this time. I had a night shift job where I was able to steal time from my boss because no one else was awake. And so I would sew clothes while monitoring a studio, and uh, I only had to walk through the building once every two hours. So I also did research and uh, would sew, listen to lectures, find out about the Schumacher Center. Um, and finally, this person, Ethan Miller, responded to an email I wrote. And he said, our burden is not to develop a new abstract blueprint or scheme that we must then convince or force everyone to follow. It is rather to identify the spaces of hope and creation that surround us, to name them, celebrate them, organize to strengthen and connect them, and in so doing, create new relationships and possibility. And so, this group, Solidarity NYC, did need a media coordinator and someone to make their site first exist and then look beautiful. So I brought together lots of people I had met through trade school and our goods, and we helped make a map where you can see that although New York City might seem like the center of cutthroat competition, there are actually many groups that are practicing direct democracy, cooperation, social justice, and ecological sustainability. I made this boss, this boss, I made this uh, poster that eventually lots of people, including bosses, were very uh, excited by or threatened by, depending on their management structure. Um, it says, I don't have a boss, I don't have a landlord, I don't pay for school, I don't hoard my stuff, I don't buy food that kills, I don't let my bank profit off me. Because I'm a worker owner in a cooperative business, I'm a member of a land trust, co-op, or intentional community, I participate in self-organized schools and demand free education, I take part in tool shares, barter clubs, and clothing swaps, I'm a member of a food co-op CSA or community garden, and I joined a credit union so my money stays in the community. And at this time, I was asked to teach a class at the New School, which to me was 
quite funny, speaking of imposter syndrome, because I don't have a master's degree, and that has become a professional requirement for artists somehow. And I thought I'd love to teach a class on barter and solidarity economies. So I proposed to the students that we each give $5 to a common emergency fund so that if anyone needs it, they can draw from it in class. And the student said, it's not our responsibility. If someone has an emergency, it's up to them to figure it out. And so the ongoing question of the class and what I think we're still grappling with today in this talk and the one before is who is responsible? Who gets to traffic in narratives of choice and luck and freedom? And when do we need to first learn how to heal together and support one another and then imagine systems and policies and structures that actually support everyone? So luckily, the second week of class, Occupy became too big to ignore. <laughs> and I got the students to go down to Zuccotti Park and we had many conversations about who might be responsible. Although soon after, in November, three years ago today, many people were evicted. As we all know, the saying goes, you cannot evict an idea whose time has come. And for many students who at the time didn't understand responsibility or political economy, they've written to me since and said that they are involved in struggles around income inequality and that slowly, first through relationships and affection and then through awareness, they find it necessary to address these issues. My friend Candace Williams says, I want my students to redefine cultures of power. I want to help create a world where all people see themselves reflected in institutions of power. I hope that through social practice art and creative placemaking in the best senses of these words, we can see this start to happen. If you don't know Rick Lowe, you will soon. He just got a MacArthur Genius Award. He says, central to the vision of Project Row Houses is the social role of art, as seen in neighborhood revitalization, historic preservation, community service, and youth education. Or maybe you've heard of the Astor Gates. He says, the imaginary is so important, having vision beyond just practical responses. I think artists can grapple with problems in that way. But I want to be careful as we tie Richard Florida to creative placemaking to social practice art and think through again what it means to be an entrepreneur of the self and what it means to see a proliferation of artists with this much debt. So Richard Florida says, the key to economic growth lies not just in the ability to attract the creative class, but to translate that underlying advantage into creative economic outcomes in the form of new ideas, new high-tech businesses, and regional growth. So let's think through what those high-tech businesses might be. And the famous white paper on creative placemaking says, creative placemaking animates public and private spaces, rejuvenates structures and streetscapes, improves local businesses, viability and public safety, and brings diverse people together to celebrate, inspire, and be inspired. Now, many of the projects that call themselves creative placemaking actually rebrand places that have been known to communities. So I think we have to be very careful about how creative placemaking and social practice are used, for whom and why. I keep thinking about the space that I know through Jen Abrams at Our Goods called Wow Cafe Theater. Wow Cafe Theater, and this is Maria Bauman who performs there and is an amazing artist, is the oldest all women and trans theater space in the country. And they're able to have this space because many artists organized together to get a building for a dollar. They actually got eight buildings for eight dollars and formed Fourth Arts Block. This is what a group called the Naturally Occurring Cultural Districts New York, or NOCD, 
calls a place. So it's a place that's been built from the grass roots over many, many decades, and it's one that has its own character and does not necessarily need to be branded from elsewhere to suddenly be revitalized. So I think I've made uh, creative places on a small scale. How might I stay put? Uh, I used to just bike by stop sign posts and attach public seats and maintain them. I've made furniture out of scavenged wood where I used to live, bronze coins that I thank people with, and Shaker-inspired mini houses. I want to commit to one neighborhood for life, but I don't know how. I want to stay put. I want to feel and see change taking shape. I want my livelihood taken care of so that I can do the work I'm called to do regardless of the paycheck. And so I started talking to my friends, people around me I love about living together and owning a place together. But soon we realized that houses that fit eight people cost two million dollars in New York City. And this means that everyone in our so-called intentional community needs W-2 income and family money, which very few of the people in our group have. And so we don't know what to do. We don't want to be an intentional community only of and for people with wealth. And we don't want to replicate a lot of the systems and structures of violence that have made this situation the case. So many of us are artists, and a different group called BFA, MFA, PhD got together to show that the reports that say arts graduates will pay back their loans in the field are wrong. That seven of the top 10 most expensive schools in the United States after scholarships and aid are art schools. We created our own report because people told us that our nice stories were just anecdotes, but that until they saw the big data, they wouldn't be convinced. So we made a report in their own vernacular, and policymakers and administrators are now calling us. We showed that although there are two million arts graduates in the country, only 200,000 are both arts graduates and make their primary income in the field. In fact, 40% of people who make their primary income in the arts do not have a bachelor's degree at all. They may have an associate's degree or a high school diploma, but they don't have a four-year degree. So what do arts graduates do for work? 23% are professionals, like managers, accountants, and chief executives. 17% are sales and office workers, 17% are educators, and 14% are not in the labor force at all. We can also see that although our country is 63% white, non-Hispanic, 81% of art school graduates are white, non-Hispanic, and 77% of working artists are white, non-Hispanic. In addition, we see that although our country is 51% female, 60% of art school graduates are female, but only 46% of working artists are female. So we have a lot of work to do. And I'm reminded of this because I realized that over the eight-year lease of this space, although it was filled with so much mutual aid, our landlord will walk away with $960,000 and will have nowhere to work. And so although we did create a community, in the end it's quite short term. And it's very precarious and we are already privileged. So what does that mean for everyone else? I went to try and get a commercial loan and I'll continue to try and do that with Lizzie who's here. And they said, you have to have profits at a certain level to show that your business won't fail. And I said, the business hasn't failed. It's been around for more than five years, and we have this entire group of artists that have worked there, and we've never been late once on our rent. And they said, no, you have to show profit. 
So if it's that hard for artists with cultural capital, it must be even harder for all people with low incomes. How might we, artists, create and support truly affordable space in New York City? And again, I was thinking of WOW Cafe Theater, because this is a space that inspired our goods in many ways. It's a place where if you want to have a one-woman show for one night and not move anything, you just need to bring some toilet paper, and that's the deal. If you want to have a long-run show for, say, two weeks where you move the lights and move everything around, you have to get trained first by other members. But it's a collective that allows anyone who identifies as a woman to enter on a Tuesday night and be welcome into the community. And I kept thinking, why is this possible? And why is it not possible for us? And then I remembered that this space, Wow Cafe Theater within Fourth Arts Block, came out of this movement with Francis Golden and so many people in the Cooper Square Committee that resisted Robert Moses. And through such ongoing organizing, they were able to create a land trust, mainly on 4th Street between 2nd Avenue and 3rd Avenue, where you see truly affordable housing, food co-ops, worker co-ops, and a thriving neighborhood that is very unlike the other streets around the Lower East Side and what's called the East Village now. And if you somehow are here but don't know what a community land trust is, I thought I should say very quickly that it's a way to maintain truly affordable housing because the land belongs to the community. So it's a community land trust because the land is held in trust by the community. It's either through a nonprofit or community-based organization, and they ensure that the leases that are rented out to those buildings, whether they're limited equity cooperatives or mutual housing associations, actually stay in mission to serve the community. And so I'm reminded by Spivak that education is the non-coercive reordering of desire, or hopefully, I'd say debt is the coercive part of that reordering. Where can I go to keep learning, to keep being transformed? For me, the New York City Community Land Initiative is the land trust school in New York City that helps me believe in a world worth fighting for. It's one made up of academics, people in the solidarity economy, members of Picture the Homeless and the New Economy Project. And so what I hope is that the solidarity, not the so-called sharing economy, will join up with Web 2.0 to advocate for land trusts in New York City. You may have heard of the sharing economy. The reason that I put this in quotations is that from 2010 to 2012 with books by Rachel Botsman and Lisa Gansky, sharing became conflated with renting. And this is not what we had in mind at Solidarity NYC when we said sharing, or solidarity, or new economy. What we meant is values of democracy and sustainability and social justice. What you see here with the sharing economy is peer-to-peer -peer rental, so that your car is not available to your neighbor, but is instead for rent. Same with a room, same with anything. So, your excess capacity is available, but only for rent. On the worst side of the spectrum, we see city shares, which is a way to invest and profit from the growth of specific New York City neighborhoods you understand, love, and believe are poised to appreciate. So this is much like a real estate investment trust for people with $50,000 or $100,000. And this is a way that computer engineers and venture capitalists are trying to use the idea of sharing to mean rent, appreciation, and liquidity. With a 12% annual return on rent, you have to wonder what kinds of neighbors you're investing in and who can possibly afford to stay in a city where not only global capital, but now a more local city shares version makes living here quite hard. So how can we let the park and the arts remain? 
Just as we need green spaces, we need to support creators of culture with long-term space. And even more than that, we need to support all low-income people because whether you're a teacher or a social worker, a faith-based leader or a community organizer or a mother, all kinds of people cannot afford to live in a city with a 12% return on housing or commercial space. And so last year I was asked by MoMA to do a project and I remembered my inability to enter that institution. And I thought I'd like to make a currency so that in some spaces in the museum you can enter without $25. So we called the currency resources and in order to get tea, milk, or honey you had to use three resources. The space was called Exchange Cafe because I hoped that the space of commerce in the museum would be as radical as any artwork you see on the wall, getting to the root of issues that concern me and many people today. And the people who staff the cafe will not just be educators or artists, but people who are directly impacted and working on the solidarity economy and this issue we have with incarceration, inflation, bailout, crisis. So for example, Tychicus Baker is part of Milk Not Jails and he could speak directly about the solidarity economy with visitors. In addition, I think that currency today should circulate the demands and desires of the people who use it. We live in a networked information age, so I don't know why money doesn't have other information. And so I said I create furniture and demand that all museums are open after work. You receive change. These are the hands of Kenneth Edusai, who works on participatory budgeting, and Forrest Purnell. The tea that people received is part of the Feral Trade Network. You might be interested in this if you know fair trade. This is feral trade, as in willfully wild. So the artist Kate Rich has decided to stop traveling to reduce her carbon footprint and expose the economy of airfare and lodging that is so common in this information age. And so to receive tea from the Feral Trade Network, you rely on the existing travel routes of people who move in this economy of charisma and personality. And you see on your receipt all of the museums and institutions that have shipped bodies but often refuse to pay for their labor. And eventually the tea came to MoMA. The milk comes from a group called Milk Not Jails. They're a dairy cooperative that works mainly with formerly incarcerated people, showing that we spend a million dollars on blocks to incarcerate people. Their question is, why not put the million dollars in first? This is a map from the Spatial Information Design Lab that's collected by MoMA, but I thought they should also have the people that are currently working on this issue in the museums, so that it's not just a representation. So Lauren Melodia and Taichikis Baker were on staff, and they often said, if the economy relies on me, I'd rather drink milk than go to jail. I also made furniture for the space, turning prison, sorry, police, off into prison, police barricades into beds. It's an open access kit that anyone can use. And the entire goal of the space was to teach people about small encounters in artworks, a history of exchange that's often overlooked by museums because the scale is quite small. So this was a cafe dedicated to exchange practices from swaps to encounters. And the work that I love has five characteristics. The meaning is embodied. It connects two people in a reciprocal encounter. The meaning of the work is made with labor and materials. And the work moves between fine art, high art, and non-art spaces. The work should be replicated or modified. So it includes works like this, Franz Erhard Walther, this work from Dave McKenzie. This painting is a proposal. I propose we meet once a year, every year, until one of us can't or won't. 
This is a dream machine where you call in and leave a dream and it will call you back with someone else's dream. This is soap made by Antonio Vega Masatela where every hour that he works for someone who's incarcerated, they work on a work of art for him from prison. This is a famous work from Adrienne Piper. I'll read it because some of you might not know it. She handed this out to people after racist comments had been made. Dear friend, I am black. I am sure you did not realize this when you made or laughed at, agreed with that racist remark. In the past, I have attempted to alert white people to my racial identity in advance. Unfortunately, this invariably causes them to react to me as pushy, manipulative, or socially inappropriate. Therefore, my policy is to assume that white people do not make these remarks, even when they believe there are no black people present, and to distribute this card when they do. I regret any discomfort my presence is causing you, just as I am sure you regret the discomfort your racism is causing me. And lastly, I made a networked website to show all of the people who are often made invisible, who collaborate and labor or advise projects but don't get much credit. And I started realizing that if collaboration means shared decision making, shared labor, and shared benefit, not just shared work, we would move from a product where we inform people that they can participate to something following Sherry Arnstein's Ladder of Citizen Participation, to something where we consult people and see what they'd prefer, and then finally involve them, and eventually collaborate and make alternative paths, moving from a discrete object to a process that we design, and hopefully build strong social ties. So how can you see change when you're always on the move? Grace Lee Boggs reminds us, the most radical thing I ever did was to stay put, like the trees, but we don't know if they remember. And I've been thinking about clocks, 99-year time frames, which is the longest our legal system can understand, but which allows land trusts to function, and thinking about the ways trees can be seen as clocks. So I asked my friend Gary Linkoff, who's a mycologist, what a tree my age would look like. And he said, go for a honey locust about 30 feet tall, eight inches in diameter. And so I found this one. And I thought this tree also knew Y2K around 2000. And in 2015, next year, let's hope the tree will know that Mayor de Blasio might announce that the city will create a housing trust fund supported by a dedicated revenue stream generated by increasing the property taxes on vacant and luxury properties. Funds from the housing trust fund will be used to develop and preserve truly affordable housing for people with very and extremely low incomes. And it could also support the development of community land trusts. This is what Claudia Wilner from the New Economy Project hopes. And that by 2030, we'll see, as Pope Francis says, that empty convents and monasteries can be used to house those in need. These empty spaces, he said, are not for the church to transform into hotels and make money from. Empty convents are not ours. They are for the flesh of Christ, refugees. That's what Karen Gargamelli from Common Law wrote. And that by 2045, Someone born today, November 15th, 2014, will be 31, around my age. She'll be standing here just as Yvonne Rayner was with a mind as a muscle 60 years ago. And let's hope that having grown up in a majority minority country with a black, gay, female president, she will be so strong and so wise. She will speak about the open source software she created and shared with public libraries for participatory budgeting, allocating city funds to those most in need. Knowing that her university doesn't charge $120,000 for a degree and that the endowment is invested in CDFIs for affordable housing, she knows that housing is a human right. And by 2060, with this memory of Occupy in our hearts, East Harlem, the El Barrio Land Trust, will be 46 years old. So imagine 2060, 
Whisper something to yourself about what you hope is true. As I find often in the studio, you might tell yourself something you didn't know you already knew. And watch these trees grow. By 2075, your wish will grow true. And if you're lucky, you might even see a chicken of the woods. As Dr. Cornell West tells us, and what makes me so happy every day, is that justice is what love looks like in public. So let's celebrate the churches and the art ministries and the places that protect our desires to speak truth to power, to share stories, to hone crafts, to make beauty, to build community, to retell histories, take risks, be our whole selves, and communicate without words. I've done this in small ways by co-organizing infrastructure in the service of short-term artworks and long-term community, and I know that we can continue to do this. For there are no new ideas. There are only new ways of making them felt, of examining what our ideas really mean, feel like, on Sunday morning at 7 a.m., after brunch, during wild love, making war, giving birth, while we suffer the old longings, battle the old warnings, and fears of being silent and impotent and alone, while tasting our new possibilities and strengths. Let us hope that creative entrepreneurs are not just entrepreneurs of the self, but are people who can demonstrate a praxis of cooperation and mutual aid. Thank you.